Welcome to Raw Online. Today we have a very important topic, the furosemide stress test. Okay, this is going to be a must question in your viva voice. So the idea behind this is, in your ICU or in your emergency department, if you see a patient with acute kidney injury and there is decreasing urine output, there are various reasons for it, right? Pre-renal, renal, post-renal sort of it. So we need to have an idea whether the anatomical unit of the kidney is functional or not. Okay, is the nephrons functional or not? Okay, so furosemide stress test is going to answer that particular question. When we are sure that the anatomical unit of the kidney is functional, then the chance of recovery or completely normalizing that kidney is going to be very high. Okay, let us see what is furosemide stress test. So I'll give you an idea about what we are going to see. Okay, so basically when you give furosemide a loop diuretic, it gets into the nephrons in the proximal convivial tubule through secretory mechanism. Okay, the PCT secretes the particular furosemide into it. Then the furosemide get transported through the loop of Henle down here through the loop of Henle and over here it just blocks this chloride sodium transporter. Okay, so once it blocks a chloride sodium transporter, much of sodium is present will be held inside the lumen itself. So when there is more sodium inside the lumen, it means that there is more water inside the lumen, right? As you already know, sodium will attract water. So sodium plus water goes through the nephrons all the way around here. And if there is no obstruction post renal also, then that will be collected in the, okay, will be collected as urine. So when I give furosemide and if I see good amount of urine coming outside, it means that the entire nephron unit is completely intact. So this is the outline of furosemide stress test, okay. So introduction, acute kidney injury is common among ICU patients, okay. Biomarkers can rise even when creatinine is completely normal. So how will I know whether my patient's kidney is completely working or not? How can I pick it up very early? Some say you can use biomarkers, but you need to understand on a routine basis, we are not using biomarkers, right? On a routine basis, we may check patient's creatinine, right? But the point is biomarkers can increase when the creatinine is normal itself. For example, today morning you go around on your patient and you see the creatinine is normal, then why will you even ask for a biomarker, right? But biomarkers can increase when creatinine is normal itself. So we really don't know at what timeline we should ask for a biomarker and availability of the biomarker, the cost associated with the biomarkers are really very, very high, right? So we need to know at what time you need to do the biomarkers or we need to have other surrogative markers which can help you to identify AKI, which can help you to identify whether that particular kidney will improve or not. Okay, so thus you have this FST, the furosemide stress test. It serves the purpose of predicting the progression of AKI and possibly the need for dialysis also. So the rationale behind this furosemide stress test. Furosemide, a loop diuretic, is not effectively filtered by the glomerulus. Okay, and hence the tubular concentration of furosemide does not depend upon the GFR. Okay, so it is not the glomerulus which is putting inside the furosemide, but rather it comes into the lumen of the nephron by a different mechanism. What is that mechanism? By the PCT secretory uh, area, okay. Furosemide is transported to the proximal tubule via the peritubular capillaries and then gains access to the PCT tubular lumen by active secretion via the human organic anionic transporter system, okay. So, on a first place, there should be adequate blood supply to the kidneys, adequate blood supply to the nephrons, adequate blood supply to the PCT area, adequate blood supply to the peritubular capillaries, okay. That is where it starts. The furosemide stress test will tell you that the blood supply to the peritubular capillaries is intact, the secretory mechanism of the PCT is intact, the lumen of the nephrons is intact, and post kidney, post renal, there is no obstruction. Okay, these are the things which is going to be analyzed now. So now, but this slide tells you that the furosemide is not basically by the GFR, it is basically by the peritubular capillaries and the PCT uh, secretory mechanism. Furosemide then reaches the thick ascending loop of Henle, that is over this region. After getting secreted here, it reaches the ascending loop of Henle, where it inhibits the luminal chloride transport. 
So when it increases the luminal chloride, it's basically sodium chloride transport. Okay. So when it inhibits this chloride transport, it decreases the sodium reabsorption also. When the sodium reabsorption is affected, more amount of sodium along with water comes out as urine. Okay. Natriuresis and increased urine flow happens. Hence, the presence of brisk diuretic response to furosemide indicates there is intact renal blood flow. The proximal tubular secretory capacity is intact. The function of thick ascending loop of Henle is also intact and that indicates good functional reserve of kidneys in patients you identified as AKI. Okay. So, it tells you that the anatomical, unical, uh, anatomical unit is actually intact. Hence, the increase in urine output after furosemide administration can be used to assess the integrity of the tubular function in patients with early AKI. Okay. So, now we have this evidence, right? A patient is in AKI with adequate fluid inside the body. Now, uh, furosemide stress test, you are saying adequate urine output. So, we say that the unit is intact. Do we have any evidence on it? Yes, we do have an evidence. It started in 2013 where the Chawla et al. in a single center study evaluated the utility of diuretic response to a standard dose of furosemide and attempted to predict the progression of AKI and need for RRT based upon the amount of urine which is presented there. Okay. So, what did he do? Patients with stage 1 or stage 2 uh, AKI were administered a standard dose of furosemide. How much did he administer? So, he divided the patients into uh, furosemide naive patients, nascent patients who would never receive furosemide or category B who received furosemide in the previous 7 days. Okay, these are two different groups. Patients who never received furosemide, now in this study, he gave 1 mg per kg of furosemide. Okay. Patients who already received furosemide in the previous 7 days, now in this study, he gave 1.5 mg per kg of furosemide. Okay. So, the method is clear. So, he divided these patients into two groups. One group who never received furosemide and the other group who received furosemide in the previous 7 days. Okay. So, now the methodology goes in that way that the patient if never received furosemide in this study, he has given 1 mg per kg of furosemide. Patients who already received furosemide in the previous 7 days now received 1.5 mg per kg of furosemide as an IV bolus. Okay. So, post furosemide administration, the urine output was measured early for 6 hours and also they had a data uh, as in total for 24 hours also. The treating team in this particular study could choose to replace the first 6 hours of urine output after furosemide administration with either equal amounts of RL or NS to prevent hypovolemia. Okay. So, in one slide, if you ask me what is furosemide stress test, this is it. Okay. If the patient never was exposed, never was exposed to furosemide, then in this study, it is 1 mg per kg IV of furosemide was given. If the patient was already exposed to furosemide in the past 7 days, then you need to give 1.5 mg per kg of furosemide IV. Okay. Then watch the first 2 hours of urine. If it is more than 200 ml for 2 hours, then it is FST responsive. If in 2 hours, the urine output is less than 200 ml, then it is FST non-responsive. That is all the furosemide stress test test. So, now you know the rationale behind it, you know the reason why we are doing it and you know how to do this particular test and what is the inference in it. Okay. So, the primary outcome evaluated was progression to uh, akin stage 3 within 14 days of FST. So, now we have two different subset teams, right? One team is FST responsive and one team is FST non-responsive and they were observing how this patient did inside the ICU. Okay. That is, which team progressed to Aiken stage 3, which team progressed to dialysis, which team progressed to worsening of AKI. Okay. So, and these are the results. Out of the 77 patients studied, those with progressive AKI had a significant lower urine output following FST in each of the first 6 hours. Okay. So, it means that those who failed FST had a progressive AKI simple. Okay. Those who failed FST or FST non-responsive had progressive AKI. So, this is for first 6 hours. They did it, said it for first 6 hours, right? But you need not wait for 6 long hours to classify this patient as FST responsive, FST non-responsive. The area under the receiver operating curve for the total urine output over the first 2 hours following FST itself was showing a good prediction to progression to AKI stage 3. Okay. For that reason, the authors determined that the ideal cutoff for predicting AKA progression was a urine volume of less than 200 ml within 2 hours itself after furosemide administration. This is more likely to progress to AKIN stage 3.
Okay, so now you're you're rounding your patients either in your ER or a ward or an ICU. Identify there is acute kidney injury. You need to know whether that particular nephron unit, the kidney units, are intact or not. For that reason, with adequate hydration, you are going to do this FST. Okay, how to do an FST? If the patient never received furosemide infusion in the past seven days, then you are going to give one mg per kg of furosemide IV bolus. If the patient's already received furosemide in the past seven days, then you're going to give 1.5 mg per kg of furosemide IV bolus. Then you're going to monitor the urine output. This patient should be catheterized, okay? So within the first two hours, if the urine output is less than 200 ml, FST non-responsive. More than 200 ml, FST responsive, okay? So by this particular evidence, okay, by this particular study, they have documented that people who are FST non-responsive or progressive to akin stage 3 within 14 days, okay. There's the second evidence that Kainer et al, okay. The Kainer et al compared the performance of FST to many biomarkers for predicting the severity of AKA, okay. So, ultimately, if you see biomarkers, simply a blood test or possibly a urine test, right. So, this is not something extra drug given to the patient, right. So, we always feel safe when we do a lab investigation rather than doing a test on the patient himself, right. For that reason, they were actually evaluating biomarkers versus FST and how what best can be did for the patient, okay, which performed well. So, they demonstrated that biomarkers did not perform significantly better than the FST for predicting the progression to stage 3 AKI or the need for RRT or mortality, okay. So, in your exam, if they ask about FST, you need to know how to conduct an FST, what is the inference of the FST and on what basis, which study was the initiation point to talk about FST and why not biomarkers, okay? Which study tells you that FST is better than biomarkers? All these things you need to tell you in the exam, okay? However, when FST was combined with the other biomarkers of AKI, there was an improvement in the risk prediction for overall outcomes, okay? If you have biomarkers also at your vicinity, you can do both biomarkers and effect FST, okay? The combined data is going to help you in risk prediction better than individual data. So, there's another study, the Riva et al. performed a multi-center prospective observational study in patients with stage 1 and 2 AKI. After performing FST, the investigators observed that urine flow rate during the first two hours was the most predictive of progression to stage 3 AKI, okay, with an ideal cutoff of less than 200 ml, with a sensitivity of 73.9% and specificity of 90%, okay. So, if they ask you, is there any multicentric trial? Yes, the answer is Riva et al., okay. And is there any reason why you are going to cut off at within 2 hours itself, not 3 hours, not 6 hours? The answer is the initial study, the Chawla et al. also showed the area under the curve within 2 hours itself was performing better. And second, the Riva et al. also significantly has mentioned that within first two hours, the urine output, if it is less than 200 ml or more than 200 ml, having the 200 ml as cutoff has a sensitivity of around 73 percent and specificity of 90 percent, okay. Based on these three evidences only, you are trusting on FST and you are going to do FST for your patient, okay. There is another multicentric study, okay. I have given this in reference, dear friends, at the end of our presentation. In another multicentric study, patients were administered FST and FST non-responders were then randomized to either standard or early RRT, okay. Are you getting it? So, there are patients, okay, and you are doing the FST and that is FST positive, that is responders and FST non-responders, right. The FST non-responders was later divided into two groups. This is early group, early RRT group and standard RRT group, okay. What is early RRT in this particular trial? What is early RRT? within less than 6 hours. Why 6 hours? Basically, to arrange the mission, to put an IV line, to get the consent, all these things, they had 6 hours. But uh, if you go deep into that particular study, almost the dialysis was done in around 2 to 3 hours itself. So, this is early RRT team, okay. There is another team which is a standard RRT. What is a standard RRT? You should have standard reasons to do a RRT in that particular patient, like either it's a volume overload or hyperkalemia or significant acidosis or severe uremia, all these things stands there, okay. Unless you have a standard criteria to do a dialysis, they were never did a dialysis at all, okay. They were been waiting to have a standard criteria to do a dialysis. So, these are the three teams now we have, right. This is a furosemide test, test positive, they are responding. This is team one, okay. 
in patients who are FST negative were developed into early and standard. Early means immediately dialysis. Okay. This is team 2 and this is standard dialysis. That is, unless they have a fixed criteria, they were not dialysed. Once they reached a fixed criteria, they were dialysed. This is stage uh, team 3. Okay. So, now, if you see, compare the team 1 and 3. Okay. Team 1 is FST responders. Okay. And team 3 is FST non-responders who are just waiting for any criteria to get dialysed at all. Okay. If they don't meet a criteria, they will not get dialysed. Okay. So, these are the two teams. Now, we are going to compare team 1 and team 3. Okay. In the early RRT, uh, early group, RRT was carried out within 6 hours of randomization. In the standard RRT group, the RRT was initiated only if prescribed indications were met. The study demonstrated that among FST responsive patients, only 13.6% ended up needing RRT. So, this group, the team 1, which I tell, said you as FST responding, only 13 patients ultimately required dialysis. Okay. But among 118 patients who did not respond to FST, okay, 118 patients who did not respond to FST, 98.3% in the early RRT group and 75% in the standard RRT group needed RRT basically. So, here 75%, forget the early team at all. Early team just they did dialysis because FST was negative, just they went and did the dialysis. So, forget about that team. But compare the team 1 and team 3. In team 1, where FST is positive, responding, they are pouring out urine more than 200 ml. In that group, only 13% required F uh, RRT. But in the other group, FST negative and they were managed conservatively until any proper criteria is met. Okay. If you see that 75% in that group 3 actually went in for RRT. So, this tells you that FST can clearly differentiate people who have less chance of receiving an RRT or more chance of receiving an RRT. Okay. So, furosemide stress test seem to be a good strategy to identify patients who may benefit from early RRT. Okay. It is for this reason, you can very well tell to the family members that this patient is FST negative. When the patient is FST negative, there is more than 75% chance that the patient is going to require an RRT at any point of time. Okay. So, conclusion, considering the wide spectrum of factors contributing to the AKI in the intensive care unit and its impact on morbidity and mortality, studies to help understand its course early and guide therapy accordingly are very, very important. We need to have some data or some clinical clue whether this patient will end up at dialysis or not. Okay. Whether this patient have worsening AKA or not. Whether this patient have increased morbidity or not. Okay. All these things, any clue about all these things is very, very important. So, FST plays a big role in it. Okay. Some of the newer biomarkers, although promising and validated in large studies, are usually not widely available for clinical use and may be cost ineffective when you do it frequently, okay? Because as I already told you, the creatinine may be completely normal also. So, you need to pick up patients on based on other parameters whether to do a biomarker or not. So, morning you round the patient, the creatinine is 0.9, will you do a biomarker for that patient? Or the creatinine is like 0.7, will you do a biomarker for that patient? Understand biomarkers can still be increased when the creatinine is normal. The biomarkers can pick up AK very early, but which population will you do a biomarker? Okay, if you start doing biomarker on very, very minimal clues, then it will be cost ineffective if you do it very, very frequently. Okay, so furosemide test test seem to be a simple bedside tool that performs reasonably well in identifying patients at high risk of AK progression and need for RRT. Moreover, the utility of biomarkers may be enhanced when combined with FST response. So, our final statement is FST performs better than your biomarkers, but you still have biomarkers also, biomarkers plus FST. Okay. When a combined data is available, it helps you to identify the patient in whom the AKA progression may happen. They may have more uh, need for RRT. Okay. So, these are the references. If you really want to go deep into it, you can read on it. The Chavla et al., the Coiner et al., the Riva et al., and the last one is Lim Lurgal et al. Okay. So, thank you dear friends.